appreciate you taking the time, Jeremy, to be part of this OPSM podcast. I really do. No problem. Thanks for thanks for thinking of me. All good. Awesome. I guess we'll get started. Um, so uh, I guess the first question I wanted to ask you, Jeremy, um, how are you doing currently with the COVID pandemic personally and professionally? Yeah, you know, I think like everybody, there's some really good days and some days that aren't so good in terms of just the the mental side of it the you know the stress that comes into it but um you know overall we're doing well myself my family everybody's healthy uh, we're all together and um you know club wise uh, very similar you know while we're not all together which i think is a big part of a club right is yeah. a, a real a real club is it's a family it's uh, everybody from the back office to the uh, to the technical staff to the players and then obviously the supporters so we're not together, but everybody within the club is healthy, doing well. And, you know, we're going to continue to work hard to make sure, you know, like all clubs around the world, we can come out of this thing on the other side. So we're, we're doing okay. And I hope you guys are as well. well. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. So moving into your new role, it's been about five and six months. Um, you know, how's that been for you? And what about China? What did, um, what about China, Chattanooga enticed you to join the club? It's been, yeah, well, I was about to say it's been good, but let's be honest, the last two months, <laughs> been, it's been awkward, it's been different. Um, it's been a challenge, and, but I, I've enjoyed it. It's a, it's a fantastic club uh, with a great history, tons of culture. You know, they have a way of behaving and a way of interacting and engaging with fans and supporters in the community and expectations for players and staff. So the fact that it's a club that's been around over a decade it's it's unique that way in, in the states there's not a lot of clubs you know that have been around for a decade no. you know uh, in, in in our country so and that keeps changing and I, and I look forward to that continuing to change but um you know so when you asked what was the attraction mm -hmm. it's the people uh it's the people at the club it's the people that support and love the club it's the community it's uh, chattanooga is an amazing city uh, a lot of growth a lot of really neat things happening and it was a good challenge for me personally to take another step in my career. And, um, but I had to do that at a club that has the same values that I have. Yeah. Uh, I, th I, you know, I think that clubs around the world have to stand for something and they have to believe in some things and they have to, you know, really, you know, be engaged in a community in, in a lot of different ways. And, you know, those, it's not always easy to find those. And so when this opportunity came about, it was it was a good step, but um, you know it's been a challenging first five months. Just uh, when you throw this into the mix, what is it about Chattanooga doing? Does it solidify in the position in the city? Yeah, great questions. I think you know what it means um, you know to be in the community is it's it's more than just the eleven players that go out in the starting eleven on a Saturday night, right? It's um, you know how do those how do we interact with the community? You know, what type of things are, there's opportunities that we can bring, whether that's, um, you know, a shout out to somebody on their birthday. If it's a younger kid on a, at the stadium or on social media, it's spending time in schools. And, and a lot of this obviously has come out during the pandemic, but, you know, CFC was doing a ton of this before that hit too. Just, you know, the, com we, the community means so much to us and because we're a community club. We're different yeah. than a lot of clubs, um, you know, but I think it's just, this is how they started. It started with a handful of guys saying, you know, it started with one guy, Thomas Clark saying, look, I've been driving down to Alabama to play in this NPSL league. It's pretty cool. We could do this in Chattanooga. And so a bunch of guys got together and, you know, here we are, here we are now. But um, so it started with the community and it's going to continue with the community. Um, Jeremy, can you touch, can you speak to us just a bit about specifically about the activities that the club um, partakes in um, in Chattanooga and how much like how big of a role do you have in um, in the deci those decisions moving forward? Sure, the um, the club is you know we have the first team and you know and then we have uh, an, a youth academy that would be you know younger typical youth academy right younger ages all the way up to you know U eighteens U nineteens boys and girls. Uh, we also have a CFC foundation. And within that CFC foundation is really a lot of our grassroots programming, a lot of our touch points in the community, 
um, and some fantastic leaders that are within those. So the first one is Operation Get Active. And that is a program that is an after-school training program primarily in the summer. They also work with some uh, rec centers in the city of Chattanooga where kids can go get soccer programming at uh, a very, very low cost. And it's uh, based around schools. And there's a lot of other just wellness and nutritional and uh, just it's more than just soccer. And then we have uh, a similar program called Chattanooga Sports Ministries that uh, is neighborhood based. So if OGA is school and kind of rec center based, uh, mm-hmm. CSM really gets into to neighborhoods that maybe in a lot of cities um, don't get the attention or the resources that they need. Mm-hmm. So that's based around uh, neighborhoods, again, with soccer programming, training, uh, competition, games, and it's more about the, you know, building the entire person as well. And then Highland Park Commons is where a lot of this happens. It's a, um, it, it's in a, a neighborhood in the city. It's, if you think of what you've seen in, you know, South America, it's two turf fields, not full size, but two mm-hmm. turf fields fenced in uh, where you can play futsal type games across and say 99 games uh, going regular wise. There's pickup play, there's adult leagues, there's some programming through our foundation and our academy. And then there's just a guy that was driving by and, you know, was on his lunch break and decided to go out and juggle a soccer ball for a little bit, you know? So it's, it's a true community asset. And again, the leadership that we have in all those programs uh, is just fantastic. Well, Jamie, that's wonderful. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the C second point uh, in football and it's really, t- it drives the community. Well, that's about the, the academy. Um, how big an effect, how big of, uh, I guess, an effect does that have on the first team? And uh, moving forward, is is the plan to to bleed out youngsters into the first team? Absolutely. You know, in St. Louis, one of our, um, uh, you know, yearly, uh, you know, planning what was based around, you know, what academy players are going to be worthy of the opportunity. You know, we put pressure on our academy staff and our players, and I, I think pressure can be a good thing, right? To yeah. say every year we need to have – three players that can function in our first team environment on a daily basis. And then how do we get them there? Well, you don't get them there by the first day of preseason, just dropping them in and saying, Hey, good luck. Mm -hmm. You've, you ease them in, you know, when they're 15, you bring them in once a month and then you bring them in maybe during the summer. And then when they're 16, you know, maybe they're in two days a week. And then, you know, maybe when they're 16 and a half, they're in every day they're in it, but they, they earn that right. And that's something that I was very adamant about the, with the group in Chattanooga that needs to be part of our plan is we need to get to a point. And we're not there yet, um, but I think we're quickly going to get there with some different things that we have going on where our first team technical staff can count on every year, you know, two to four players that are in our academy uh, that, can, that can survive in that daily environment. And I think that's always been my take is can a youth player, can an academy player survive in a daily environment? It doesn't mean they have to play X amount of minutes. I don't believe that um, a player should have, you know, a a plan, um, an IDP that says, hey, by the time he's 17, he needs to get 33% of all minutes for the reserve team if you're in a reserve situation. That's fake. Um, When he he deserves it, um, he's going to get those game minutes. But being able to survive in the daily environment means they can deal with pros in a locker room. They can deal with the physical demands. They can also deal with the mental demand of working very hard in training every day and not killing training, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But then also drop back into their academy for a weekend game and not walk in like they're the cat's meow. Um, So we learned a lot in St. Louis. And again, I'm adamant that that that's what a real club is about which is why I think Chattanooga, if we want to be a real club, um, we're going to need to get there. And we got, again, I'm going to go back to the people. We got some really good people helping us get to that spot. Yeah. Wonderful. So the other aspect of community building, of course, is managing your stakeholders. Um, You guys have got about 3,000, I guess, stakeholders from what I read. And I guess your position is to to maintain that relationship. So how do you go about maintaining a a healthy relationship with them? And what does that mean for you as well? You guys have done your research. You know that I have, I have, uh, I have three thousand bosses around the world. Um, you know, it, it's it's another it's another unique aspect about the club that I love because again, this is common, right? And in, in much of the world, 
uh, you know, when they did the supporter ownership campaign, obviously it was, you know, prior to, to my coming into the club. So much of that hard work, those relationships, the, the you know, answering the questions and, and trying to figure out how to make this work and then going out and, and, and selling the shares in the club uh, was done by the, the board of directors, the founding members and the staff at the time. And they did a great job. So they continue to, to drive that relationship and help build those relationships. And now here I come, the new guy, uh, you know, trying to further build those relationships. So we have a, a person on our board that is their representative, uh, Claire, and, and I try to meet with Claire, you know, not just in our monthly board meetings, but once a month outside of our board meetings, to see what feedback she's getting, what she's hearing. Um, our supporter owners have uh, their own email address, direct contact to us. Um, when we had our only league game of the year uh, out in Oakland, I met with a group of the, our Oakland owners, uh, supporter owners out there. The little meet and greet, of course, it was um, at an approved brewery so we could have a pint before we went down for the game and <laughs> enjoy a beer together. And our plan was to do that in all the markets that we were going to play in. So Charlotte, Detroit, um, San Diego, Los Angeles, Orange County. We have owners in, in all of those markets. So when I continue that, that's something that will continue. Um, our AGM for our, our annual, for our supporter owners will probably be a virtual, um, you know, AGM get together, but just trying to, you know, build lines of communication, um, answer questions, and just try to make sure we build that relationship because it is a very important piece of the club. And um, I've never done it before, so it's uh, learning on the fly in terms of how to manage relationships with 3,000 owners, but um, I think we're making some good strides, and we got a lot more work to do, though. We wish you luck, Garden. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Jeremy, I wanted to touch base on the, the NISA, the NEISA. Um, where does the NISA stand on the pyramid, in the American pyramid, and can you tell us about how the league will di differentiate itself from the U.S. cell or, or even the MLS? You know, I think, uh, you know, NISA is, um, you know, sits at the Division Three professional level in, in the United States. So you've got, um, you know, MLS, which is a separate entity. You have USL Championship, which occupies the Division Two status. You have USL League One, which is at the same status as us as a Division Three. But the USL is its own entity and the NISA is its own entity. So, um, you know, it was built around the, the understanding that, um, soccer needs to grow into markets that have been, you know, underserved at the professional level. You know, for years, if you lived in, I'm going to pick, um, uh, if you, you lived in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, where there's a USL League One team, right? If you lived there, your access to professional soccer was the closest MLS team, yeah. which for a long time was a really long ways away. And so what, you know, I think a lot of lower leagues and USL has done a great job, and I think Nice is, uh, beginning to do a great job is to figure out how can we bring the game to other markets because you know how can we then develop community and 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 how can you uh, give young kids an opportunity to have aspirations about being a pro by going to watch a high level game you know college soccer filled that void in the U.S. for a long time you could go watch a, a good high level game but there's a difference between being an amateur college player <clears throat> and a professional athlete so it's just really tried to He's just tried to find those markets and, and those unique stories. I mean, Detroit City has a great story of how they came along and what they did to, you know, build or you know, refurbish their own stadium. And um, it's just a, it's a little bit of an independent mindset. And, uh, but Nisa's biggest thing is, you know, we want to be able to bring the game to, to markets that deserve and, and, and need um, professional soccer and just do it a different way than what's being done, you know, currently in some other leagues. So, we got a long way to go, but there's some really good people in the room and um, some clubs, everybody, you know, clubs around the world find their own way to make it work. I think sometimes we lose sight of that because in the U.S. at least with MLS, most clubs operate the same way, right? They yeah. all they all bring in revenue the same way. Well, around the world, it's, it's up to each club to figure out how are they going to bring in revenue and how are they going to serve their community. And it's not cookie cutter. And how we're going to – be involved in Chattanooga as in our community and how we're going to stay afloat um, with our revenue and managing expenses and all that is going to be different than what the Oakland roots do. And that's real soccer. And I think 
here. You see that a little bit in some leagues in the U.S. Um, like, again, maybe not at the MLS level. I think everybody there survives the same way. But at these other levels, you, you have to figure it out. And when you figure it out, you can do some great things uh, in your community. No, I completely agree with that. And also, Jeremy, do you think the MLS will, I mean, America will develop the whole promotion relegation aspect now with all these leagues that are being built? So we're going to go there, huh? All right. <laughs> Jeremy, me, I had to ask. I had to ask that question. I know. No, no, Jeremy, right. I think, let's refer yeah. that question, Gordon, sorry. Do you feel that uh, the lack of vertical integration is healthy for development? The lack of it is healthy for development? Yeah, do you think it's healthy for development within the leagues? Like, L- look, um, entity, competing interests, they're complete. How does that affect the development of football in America? I think it stunts it. I think it stunts it on the field and I think it stunts it in, in the business world because, you know, you can be really successful and do a really good job, but, you know, maybe you don't get opportunities to showcase your community again at a higher level because you can't do it. But for, for me, I'm a competitive. So I do think our current structure with all the different entities is, is, is crazy. But I also think it's, it's our involved. It's our, how we've evolved as a country, right? Because yeah. I remember when the NASL folded and I cried, uh, like a little kid and I remember <laughs> and I also remember the very first MLS game and I also remember going to you know the old uh, US ISL games where they did you know you could do kick-ins and you know they had these crazy rules for a year or two and I had a good friend or teammate that played in that league for the mm-hmm. Rockford Raptors and they had a game in Hawaii which just shows how stupid soccer is in our country we had a team from northern illinois traveled to hawaii for a game mm-hmm. and so because of decisions that are like that we've had to really put some constraints and some structures into place to make sure that the game stays alive mm-hmm. and builds and now that it is building and stuff can we look at maybe how can we do some things a little bit more together and more in unison and, and maybe differently um, to go to the question do i feel uh, do i think it's going to happen I can't avoid Godwin's question. I do. I think it's going to, I think it's going to, I don't think it's going to look maybe necessarily how everybody wants to see it, but I think at some point it's going to happen. And, you know, I just think it's, it's the American spirit, right? And you have a chance to, to build yourself into something. You know, you hear stories. I'm the first person from my family to go to college or I'm the first person, you know, to get, you know, to go do this. And those are stories that we love to tell. And I think, at some point, we're going to need that story in sport. I don't know if the three of us will be alive to see it. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think at some point, uh, it's going to happen. And I think it does hurt us on the field, too. Because, look, I'm a competitive person. Yeah. And I yeah. think learning, learning to win and learning to lose is part of development. And, um, and I think that development can happen at the pro levels. I mean, look at you know, Jay DeMerit went to England, and he saw what can happen, you know, through promotion and relegation and all that. And, and, you know, I think um, he got better because of it. And I think when players experience that type of pressure, I think they get better because of it. I think in our country too often, you know, the pressure isn't real. And, again, it's just part of our progress. Now, Jay, we talked a bit about um, leading in players to the youth. I mean, getting players from the academy. What other pathways um, – obviously, there's a collegiate level and stuff like that. But what other pathways – do you guys look at when um, bringing in players? So, you know, as a, as a new professional club, it's been a, you know, a big part of, um, you know, our development as, as a pro club, you know, for years, they were an amateur club that just brought in really good college players, mm-hmm. treated them very well for three months and, and had some unbelievable seasons. Uh, but now the recruitment we're recruiting, you know, uh, against a ton of, uh, you know, a ton of places and a ton of clubs and leagues and countries. So it's different. You know, I think um, our technical staff has done a very good job of, of building a roster um, a lot of different ways, you know, and the majority of it has been through connections and people that they knew and, and players that they've either worked with in the past or they would have liked to maybe work with in the past. And now they got the chance to. So um, from a recruitment model, we, you know, we rely on, you know, agencies uh, that we know and, and trust for part of it. We rely on our network in terms of, hey, I had so-and-so and, you know, I saw him at a college game and well, I'm not looking for a left back, but man, you guys should look at this kid. He's young, he's good, he's hungry. 
take a look at them. We bring them in the preseason. So, you know, the technical staff handles all of that. They bring me in, you know, as needed with some help, but you know, a ton of time on video, a ton of time on the phone, researching character of the players and stuff. Um, you know, and I think overall we've been able to, to build out a, a decent roster and, um, you know, we got some exciting partnerships, you know, that we're working through on the international side that could maybe open up some other good opportunities for us as well. And I was going to ask about those partnerships, but we might not be privy to those right yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Do you have any, Do you have anything? Jeremy, What's that? Jeremy, no, touch base on that, on the, on the players on your roster. What, what exactly are like the type of players that you're looking for? Um, I guess, and like maybe specific to the positions, to like strikers, midfielders, defenders, what are like the character traits as well that, you know, Chattanooga looks in for players? So you got the wrong guy on for that question because <laughs> part, of, uh, part of the moves that, um, the move that I made from St. Louis to uh, Chattanooga was to get more involved in the business side. Now in St. Louis, we had a very small staff. Yeah. So I got a ton of experience on the technical side and then a lot of experience in the business side. And so this role is different. Yeah, but I'm still involved in it. So, but I, I mean, I think they, you know, I think what Peter and, and Bill look for, and, and I agree with them, is you know there has to be a level of passion. You know, at this level of, of football, um, nobody's getting six figure contracts. Um, guys are are having to you know find ways to um, you know to be creative in their in their lifestyle. And I think we do a very good job of taking care of our guys. They've all remained at our contract during this pandemic. And I think, um, they're really well taken care of, but nobody at these levels is doing it, um, you know, solely for the financial piece. So you have to have, you have to find passion. You have to find guys that are hungry and uh, whether that hunger is to keep playing at the level they're at, or that hunger is to get to another level. Um, so I think that's the first thing that those guys look for in terms of character traits and then engagement with the community. If you don't have to be on Twitter every day with 30, you know, thousand posts, but you better be willing to sign an autograph for a young kid after a game when we lose 3-2 at the, in the 90th minute. You, you better act a certain way when we're walking through an airport or at a team meal in another city. Um, you know, those are just, there are certain expectations that the culture has developed, and those character things are a big piece. Um, but, yeah, if you want to know more about the soccer, what those guys mm -hmm. are looking for, you got to get them on the call. Yeah. Um, but it, I think that hunger and that passion is, is a big, big component. That's good. Thank uh, you for that. Yeah, Jeremy, thanks a ton. Um, we don't want to keep you here too long. We know you're busy guys. So we have just the final part of our podcast. We always have a Q and answer, Q and a answer period, question and answer period for the, for the guests. And so we're going to put you back into your, um, roster management, uh, role for a second and ask you to uh, pick between um, a couple of players that you, that you choose to, to build your team. So the first question we have is, um, if you were going to build your team, would you choose Suarez or Lewandowski? Oof. Um, well, as a, as a Liverpool fan, I don't know uh, who I should take, but I would take Suarez. Love, love that answer. Love that answer, Jeremy. Love that answer. I'm a Liverpool fan <laughs> <party> as well. <laughs> <laughs> the second one we got is um, Lampard, Gerrard versus or Skulls. Now, you got to be objective on this one. Uh, uh, Skulls. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the next one we got is uh, Iniesta versus Zidane. Uh, Zidane all day. Oh, wow. That's a good one. I love that. And then last one is close to home. Kobe Jones or Claudio Reyna? Uh, based on the roster, I've said so far, we're a little heavy in the center of the park, so I'd have to go Kobe Jones. Oh, wow. Uh, Coach, thank you. I mean, boss, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking the time. Um, we, we, we're glad for this opportunity, and we wish you the best and stay safe. Guys, I appreciate it. It's always good to, to talk about, you know, the game at this level and the fun things that are occurring. So um, I appreciate it, and you guys stay safe and uh, take care. Take care. So you got some Chattanooga fans up here, so good luck. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> well, maybe we can uh, – maybe when all this goes away, we can get an exhibition up that way um, against the CPL team. That would be unbelievable. Yeah. That would be awesome. We would set that up for sure. Thank you, boss. All right, guys. Yeah. Take care. Take care.